Is it historically reasonable? Are the Gospels historically reasonable and reliable to a certain degree that we can measure as historians? And I think we would say, yes, they are. And there are reasons for that, for testifying to the resurrection of Jesus. First of all, we don't just have one Gospel, we have four Gospels. Four Gospels that tell us the same thing, that Jesus was raised from the dead. Um, Second of all, we have Paul's letters corroborating this fact that Jesus rose from the dead. In other words, they corroborate one another because many of Paul's letters, most of Paul's letters, in fact, were written before the Gospels. So here's, and here's my third point, here's this Jew who at one point is persecuting the church violently, held the jackets and coats of those who stoned Stephen, as, as we see in the book of Acts. Yet somehow this Jew becomes a believer in Jesus and a follower of Jesus, so much so that he becomes the chief apostle and the chief witness, chief apologist, as you will, for the Christian faith. Now, how do you explain that historically? And then you have the discovery of the empty tomb being attributed to women. Now, in the first century, women were not considered credible witnesses in a court of law. If a woman, if a woman um, uh, witnessed a crime, she could not go to court and testify because her testimony was not taken seriously. So why would the disciples pick women to be the witnesses to the resurrection unless that's really what happened? They were just reporting uh, what happened. And then you have the disciples of Jesus coming to believe that Jesus rose from the dead and like I said, preaching that beginning in Jerusalem and then going all the way to their death. Now people would die for things that they um, they think are true even, even though they are mistaken. Uh, they, they would die for that if they really believe that what they are dying for is true. But if they know that it is not true, if they were making it up, they would have known it wasn't true. And then they would not have been prepared to die for it. And they died in separate places, all convinced that Jesus uh, had, had appeared to them alive after the crucifixion. We often find that immediate objection comes up against an anti-supernaturalism. The person is arguing from philosophical naturalism or materialism in which their world, there is no possible intervention in their system. So basically they believe in a universe of cause and effect within a closed system. And the idea therefore is that as Christians or religious people, we are somehow invoking a world of fantasy and unbelief. But we believe in a universe of cause and effect in an open system that there's an agency that can act. So I think what we've got to uh, define, and I know in my own case when I've had this discussion with people talking about miracles and, and so forth or the possibility, is that if God exists by definition, miracles would be logically possible. I mean, if he's a greater being than by which anything else exists, he is the greatest of all, is he omniscient, all powerful and so forth, then the very name God carries the attributes of the ability to do anything within his system. And generally speaking, those scholars who presuppose that no God exists will throw up their hands and they will say, we don't know what happened. And I would venture to argue, if your presupposition is that God doesn't exist and that leads you to a dead end, perhaps we can start exploring other presuppositions. Maybe God does exist. We have this whole host of evidence that miracles happen, maybe there's a miracle that happened here. And in fact, that's what everyone testified to at that time. It's the best explanation by far. And if we as scientists presuppose naturalism, we're doing ourselves a disservice, especially if we don't look into the evidence around us.